if there's one thing on earth that's going to kind of like rip that box open, it's falling in love. Falling in love always, always, always awakens in us the thoughts, feelings, aches, longings that we had in our families growing up. Welcome to Lovelink, your guide to love and sex in all forms. We're your hosts, Simone Humphrey and Sina Simon. Today we'll be talking to researcher and practicing clinical psychologist, Dr. Alexandra Solomon. She specializes in helping young adults navigate the often treacherous waters of romantic love and teaches the now famous undergraduate course we all wish we'd taken in college entitled Building Loving and Lasting Relationships, Marriage 101. In addition to being a sought-after expert on relationships, she's a clinical assistant professor at Northwestern University and author of the recently published book, Loving Bravely, 20 Lessons of Self-Discovery to Help You Get the Love You Want. We are thrilled to have her on the Lovelink podcast to discuss self-work and dating insights that can help you find and create fulfilling romantic relationships. Welcome, Alexandra. Thank you. Yeah, so to start, we all enter psychology uh, for different reasons, but a lot of the time it's rooted in wanting to understand something about our histories or ourselves. I know that's the case for me. Um, So I'm curious what drew you to the field and specifically to the area of romantic love. That's a great question. I, you know, I spent the first 20 years of my life with no other idea in my head, but, but, but um, wanting to become a pediatrician. I was like hell bent on just college was in my mind, an avenue to get from high school to medical school. And that was all I wanted to do. And uh, partway through college, I took a women's studies class and my mind was blown. And it, it, it was uh, the first time I was able to bring together my intrinsic interest in relationships, power, gender, um, with, you know, academic learning and it, it really set me on fire. And I, for sure, you know, as the daughter of a divorced family system and a pretty complicated blended family system, I was definitely curious to understand sort of why was I the way that I was? Why did I view love the way that I viewed love? And then to add in sort of the interest in gender and power and privilege. Um, so that was like a real opening for me to psychology and the study of relationships. And I, I've never spent a single day in my career bored, you know, like it's just endlessly um, fascinating. And I feel privileged that I've been able to do this work. I I feel really sure that I wouldn't be in year 20 of my marriage with my husband had I not, you know, become really a student of love. Wow. Amazing. How did you find love with your husband? Well, <laughs> we... Um, so he was the boy across the hall in the dorm freshman year at the University of Michigan. And, um, and we became best friends. And then we would like kiss a little bit at a party and then go back to being best friends. And so we, we had this love story that for many years I carried a bit of shame about because it wasn't like this electric, like see each other across a dance floor or, you know, it wasn't fireworks. It was like we walked in, you know, we started with this really gentle friendship and built from there. And over the last number of years, you know, as I've worked with college students, as I've opened up more about our love story, I've realized that in some ways that has, the pendulum has swung in such a way that I think that many of my students crave a similar kind of love story where there's a kind of trust, you know, so often now there is, um, there's sexual connection and then emotional vulnerability and emotional intimacy are sort of retrofitted into the equation. So I have found interesting reactions among my students sometimes as I've shared my story with, um, with Todd. But we, we've been, you know, we've been together in one form of another basically since we were 19. Wow. So when you look back, what do you remember about being single, if anything? Yeah, not much. Really not much. It is interesting to be somebody who does so much work around dating and, um, and looking for love when it wasn't really ever much a part of my life. I really never had experiences of being um, an independent adult 
single dating, looking for love. That was not part of my journey. I have been in this long-term relationship for a long time. I have loved sitting with my friends and my clients and my students and sort of like being with them as they tell their love stories and sort of noticing, sharing my reactions and my insight and my perspective. But that's really has been, I've been much more a spectator of the dating world. So tell us a little more about this class that you teach, because it sounds so incredible and something that I never had any kind of opportunity to learn how to have a relationship in college, probably when I needed it most. So what do you cover in the course and what are students coming away with? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, the course was um, the course was designed when I was I was still a graduate student when it was first launched, and um, two of my mentors, you know, were couples therapists and and working with couples who were many years into their relationship and troubled, and they became really curious about sort of like what could we, what how could we reach young people and how could we what what do we need to talk to them about when they are first exploring love, intimacy, sex, identity, connection, conflict, you know, all these kinds of things. How, what can we do sort of preventatively? And that was the place from which the Marriage 101 course was born. And I've been um, part of it for years as a lecturer and a teaching assistant. And now I've been in the leadership role of the class for, I don't know, probably going on seven years. And um, the design of the class, so it, it sits at the intersection of academic learning and experiential learning. So we have this like really rich body of relationship science, right? Where we know foundational key core principles that need to be in place for people to be successful and to thrive in love. So we can share from an academic perspective that relationship science, but we also are doing every single week, every step along the way is we're challenging our students to apply the material to their own lives because um, the heart of the course, the heart of the Loving Bravely book is this idea that real love is an an inside out kind of a journey. It starts with your own relationship with yourself. There's something that sounds so cliche and trite about that, but it's so true. And when you look at approaches to couples therapy, you know, you find this the same idea that your relationship with yourself, how you relate to your story, your childhood, your early experiences, your beliefs, your thoughts, your feelings, all of that shapes then how you reach for somebody else especially in the digital age, you know, where we can kind of be behind our phones, swiping, looking for a partner, I think it's more important than ever that, that, um, that lovers have ready, um, easy access to their own internal world, you know, and have a curiosity um, for their own internal processes. So that's what we're really trying to light on fire in our college students is that what's going to end up being hopefully a lifelong relationship with themselves what I love about the book is it's not a self-help book where you're saying, you know, do this, do that. It's really about how do you cultivate that curiosity for yourself about what you want in a relationship. And I love that you open up the book with this quote by Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better Then, when you know better, do better. And I'm wondering, you know, I'm curious can you talk a little bit more about what's involved in developing relational self-awareness, as you call it? Yeah. I really think about it as not a one and done. I mean, I think there is, there's a part of it that is about putting together the puzzle of who you are. I remember when we were first working on the book, you know, one of the first ideas I wanted to uh, offer readers was just this idea that your past shapes how you love. I thought, okay, well, so that'll be one chapter. And my graduate student team was like, you have to realize this is not, this is for many people, a new idea, like slow down, break it down, really explore what does that mean that our past comes with us when we love? And that's such a key principle. And it's not about parent blaming and it's not about staying stuck in a victim stance, but it is about the way that our early experiences, whatever they were, they don't sort of like get put in this box, you know, like off to one side, um, or if they have been, if we have sort of put early painful patterns from the past, if we put them in a box, if there's one thing on earth that's going to kind of like rip that box open, it's falling in love. Falling in love always, always, always awakens in us um, the thoughts, feelings, aches, longings that we had in our families growing up. It just replicates, right? This is what we know from attachment theory. Um, It's a replication process. It's a repeat. It's a redo. And so that's not, that's neither here nor there, good nor bad. It just 
is. So the only question is, how are you going to relate to the ways in which love stirs you? So that's, that's a really key element of relational self-awareness and everything else kind of goes from there. The, the skills that we need, um, everything kind of goes from that foundation that, um, that every moment in our lives kind of weaves, weaves through and shapes how we experience this moment. And, and same for our partners, right? So we can kind of, I know it's easy for me to kind of sometimes relate to my husband as a blank slate to sort of, you know, forget that he's also a man who's showing up for this conversation with his own patterns and history. And that when I can remember that in him, I can show up with a lot more empathy and compassion and curiosity for his take. So when you're talking to students or even patients who may be older in their 20s and 30s, um, what advice or, or what conversations do you have with them about what, what they should be looking for when they're first meeting a potential partner, both in terms of what they should be reflecting on in themselves and in the other person? Well, I do think there are some ways. Um, so, so to me, it, it all comes back to um, relational self-awareness and being somebody who values paying attention to your thoughts and feelings and reactions and looking for that quality in a partner. And so I think that there are ways that relational self-awareness shows up even in like the early dating days. Like I, to me, it's a red flag if the person that you're interested in talks about their exes in very like black and white terms, you know, she was crazy. She was nuts. She was the wrong person for me. She, you know, those sort of like, um, versus a story that's more like, you know what, there was we had these things going for us. We couldn't get past this one problem or the timing wasn't right. Or in hindsight, I can see the ways that I wasn't bringing my best self to the relationship and that set this pattern off in her. You know, I think those are two stories that have really different qualities. And I would want, um, I would encourage people to be looking for a partner where they can hold on to those shades of gray, you know, where it's not just sort of like either this or this. Um, because that, that's the essence of love. I mean, there's very few things in a long-term relationship where it's like, I'm 100% right and you're 100% wrong. You know, those don't, <laughs> those, we don't get those. There, there's, it's always these sorts of like dances. So looking for a partner who can think like that, who views the world as contextualized, as um, there's multiple things going on at once. Those to me are really positive indicators. I can see that black and white thinking really coming across in the relationship in terms of arguments or conversations and not just about how they saw the relationship generally, but kind of manifesting in all sorts of ways. I, I think a really important practice is coming home from a date and um, really like tuning into yourself, you know, like sort of noticing how you feel before, during and after and I think especially for women who are dating men, it can be really easy to get focused on whether or not he liked me. And um, I think it's really important, or I guess anybody who has sort of that people-pleasing pattern, I think it's really important to ground yourself in sort of how did I feel before, during, and after? What stirred in me? How open did I feel? How connected did I feel? How energized did I feel? You know, sort of like using the data of your own body. Um, it's an important practice versus getting just focused on what did the other person think of me? Yeah. What do you make of that? Because I have many girlfriends who um, are single and dating. And that is really a thing where we'll, I'll be talking to them about a date they went on or some guy they're seeing. And it all becomes about the guy, like, are, you know, this anxiety, am I good enough? Why isn't he calling? You know, and it's like, wait, but do you actually want to be with this person? <laughs> What do you make of that, that, that dynamic? And it's not, obviously, it's not for all women, um, but it is certainly something that's pretty prevalent. I think part of it is woven into the dating scene. Like there's something about the modern dating scene that is um, really low, kind of the low accountability dating, you know, um, where there's a, a setup for feeling like um, a, a fear of being more invested and um, kind of an attention to who's putting in more effort, who's making the first move. And um, I think it can be really empowering. I think this is why um, Bumble as an app has done so well for women who date men because it puts women in the driver's seat. I think there's just a craving to feel empowered, you know, and so there's, there's a way that app kind of 
um, invites women to feel empowered. But I think that women can do that and men and men can do that, um, whether or not they're using the app, just in terms of like not being afraid to be the one who says, I like you, to be the one who says, I want to see where this can go. Um, there's sort of, I think sometimes it's like race to the bottom of sort of hiding hiding your feelings and not coming across as needy. There's so much fear about being needy or being interested or being the one who's a little bit more vulnerable. But love, that's what love, love requires us to kind of stake a claim, you know, and say, I'm feeling this, I'm interested, where are you? Um, and I think that that um, that can be experienced as really inviting and really attractive when somebody is not afraid to just feel what they're feeling, express what they're feeling. And I think part of being vulnerable is taking risks. And it means that there might be disappointment on the other end and to have trust that you can get through it, even if you put yourself out there and it's not reciprocated. Yes. And that that doesn't have to mean that the story becomes, I blew it. I screwed it up. I'm doomed. There can be a story from that very experience. It's very prideful, you know, where where what you did was you you had the chance to bear witness to yourself behaving courageously, you know? And there's a pride that comes in being like, I was really interested and I followed that interest and I expressed my interest. And just because it wasn't reciprocated doesn't need to become a story about my worthlessness. It's instead a story about my courage. I think the other direction too that many people go into on their first date is this expectation that you're going to fall in love and there's just going to be sparks and passion. And I think about the way you described your relationship starting, which was actually kind of a slower burn rather than kind of fireworks. And so I'm wondering what you have to say about first dates that are good and maybe there is some connection, but maybe aren't fireworks. And how do you evaluate whether you should pursue something that you don't necessarily feel that kind of tingly connection with, but there could be potential in? I um I frequently talk about that there are that love stories have there are a variety of chapter ones to love stories, you know, and I think that we are we are a culture that has high value on romanticism and and we define romantic as right early chemistry that feels like butterflies in our stomach. But there can be all kinds of um I think there can be lots of different chapter ones and in fact a a I don't know what the correlation is between butterflies on date one and really amazing sex. I don't think it's very high because what goes into really great sex is more than just that sort of like butterflies and pure sexual chemistry. Really great sex has this blend of um, safety, trust, communication, empowerment, play, surrender that is more complicated than just what I'm going to be, literally on date one, I can't feel um, a kind of emotional openness, readiness to play, um, just because we don't have that variable of time. We haven't built anything across any amount of time that's going to necessarily set us up to really have fun, you know, sexually. So I, um, I don't, to me, it's not a red flag for somebody to come home from a first date without butterflies. That's not to me a red flag. I don't worry about that. And so the other version of beginnings of love can sometimes be when there is this idealization of the the other person from the beginning and very intense butterflies. And then what you refer to as the fall from grace can happen also pretty quickly. In my experience and and you know just in talking to friends because people are dating multiple people and there's this sense that there's all this choice out there that this movement into idealization and then the fall from grace can happen very quickly. And I'm wondering how you work with people where there is, you know, to not have the fall from grace be the end of the relationship if it does start to happen, because inevitably the idealization of the other person is going to die down at some point. That's right. Right. It, it transforms. And the early idealization, I think, in the best of cases becomes sort of like um, those memories that you get to fall back on in year five of a marriage or a relationship when you have a little screaming newborn baby, you know, then the two of you can sort of <laughs> sit together. Yeah. And you can be like, oh my gosh, remember that date we had at the restaurant and the moon was out? And, you know, those are, that really is, you know, the pretty much the function of 
early idealization is that when life happens, because it does, if you want to be with somebody over any amount of time, right, there's going to be so many highs and so many lows. And the point of those, those early romantic moments, the point of them is that you get to kind of use that as fuel in the rough moments, you know, and you can kind of come together and say, okay, this is not where we are right now, but we had that and we will have it again. Um, so that really is is the point of that. But you're right. I think in this, um, you know, Bill Doherty talks about sort of the consumer, like uh, having a consumer mentality when it comes to love. And I think that's a big part to me of being self-aware is trying to figure out how to combat that in yourself. Like once, once we start thinking about people as interchangeable or we, we're breaking them down into their component parts, like I like you know, I like this one's abs and this one's income and this one's hair and this one's personality and this one's family. Like once we start breaking people down into their component parts, we're sort of like, um, we're, we're slipping into that consumer mentality versus, um, trusting the sort of mysteries of love and keeping, um, just kind of riding along with the energy of love and just maybe not being quite so analytical about um, breaking people down and kind of assessing them on different domains and making pros and cons lists and all these things that I think we can do in this dating, um, you know, certainly in this dating age when people may have a number of pots in the fire, so to speak, but to resist that urge or push back against that urge a little bit because there's a lot about love that is just mysterious and requires, like you were saying before, a little bit of a leap of faith, a little bit of risk taking, a little bit of trusting. Yeah, and and I think setting yourself up in a consumer mentality sort of sets you up for dissatisfaction. If you think about shopping or things things that we like to buy, you always want the next thing. And so you're I think it's actually prevents people from really throwing themselves into something that is romantic and is giving someone a chance. And I think it also from the person who's being consumed, like, do I meet X, Y, and Z standard for this other person? So I think it kind of can go both ways where you're not feeling good about yourself. Right. You're like, wait, I don't have those qualities. How do I pretend I have those qualities? Right. Because there's only so long that we can be doing that to the other person before it starts to catch up with us that they must, then that means maybe they're doing that to us. And it doesn't, it doesn't feel good. Um, That spot doesn't feel good. and, And we deserve to be um, t- we deserve to be taken in as whole people and not broken down into our component parts. So I think it's it's that idea of um, of sort of being the change you want to see in the world. You know, <laughs> like being you know sort of dating the way that you want somebody to be um, dating you. And you're right that we're not. There is no such thing as a perfect person. And for those for those who are looking for a relationship that's going to go the distance or last a long time, really you're choosing the person who you're going to be in the foxhole with, you know, you're choosing the person that you're going to be with through the storms of life as well. So, um, so that's really like, you're choosing, a, an ally. Um, and those are really the, thing, the things that, that are more important than kind of breaking down and comparing things that maybe are not so relevant. So getting clear on what's relevant, salient, and most important. So, I mean, unfortunately it seems like dating apps are people's primary means of finding partners. And like you said, it often does produce this kind of consumer mentality. So how do you recommend kind of conscious or mindful online dating? And how can you still maintain some kind of romance and something that that seems kind of very unromantic? It's an era where people can go for sheer quantity. I think it's easy to think I just have to do enough first dates till I find um, that person and um, and maybe resisting the urge to to go so hard and so fast and, and put yourself out there over and over again um, or at least to be tracking um, burnout. I think the most important thing I think for somebody who's using apps to date is to be tracking within themselves their own level of burnout. Are you finding that you're dreading getting dressed up for a date? Are you finding that you are getting cynical about the possibilities of love? Are you kind of feeling like you're having the same conversation over and over again? If those are, um, if you're noticing those symptoms, cynicism, exhaustion, it's a really good time to just take a break. Take a break, catch your breath, slow down. Um, because love really demands us well, love goes best when we when we go in with an open head and an open heart and a sense of optimism. Um, and so just to really honor that 
um, that those are those are important to pay attention to versus feeling like I just got to power through because I've got to stay out there and I have to just find the person. Um, so I think that's one piece that's really important. I think that's great advice also because, uh, you know, something you talk about that really resonated was the idea of story and narrative and how a couple creates a story together. And with all these dating apps, it can feel like there's so much pressure initially that there's almost there isn't room to kind of create the story especially if you're coming into it with a sense of cynicism or or feeling burned out then um, that's definitely not going to be be able to happen right i think also remembering that the technology is just a vehicle to get you from point a to point b you know the technology technology itself is rather neutral right it's just there it's just a tool it's just a vehicle and there's some, the data suggests that our best way to use these um, dating apps is to just move as quickly as we can from screen to screen to face to face. I think it's easy, you know, talking about the emotional vulnerability, I think it's easy to kind of get stuck behind our screens and kind of be in weeks and weeks of back and forth via text. And that's not, that's not a particularly full experience of self and other is um, that kind of highly curated, scripted, asynchronous back and forth exchange. Chemistry grows, you know, in that like dynamic face to face, multi sensory. I can see you, I can feel you, I can smell you. That that's what humans need to really get chemistry going, get interest going. So that's another piece of advice that I give is just to to move as quickly as you can to that first date. Another important point is that um, there is something about the quest for love that oftentimes involves our friends and our friends weighing in. And with apps, our friends can really weigh in, right? Like they can literally be like responding on our behalf to, um, you know, potential inquiries. And I think it's important to have um, some boundaries and to be able to at least say to your friends, hey, listen, like, <laughs> no, this is enough. Like, thank you for your interest and this is where it's going to end. Like, I'll take it from here. I've heard lots of stories about people feeling like they don't feel authorized with their friends to to put a boundary around um, input, advice, you know, even like kind of suggesting what to say and when to say it. Um, so that, that line between between friends and looking for love, I think it's important to have a boundary there. Yeah, because otherwise you just have, it's too much data that's coming at you. It becomes overwhelming. You know, some people who say this is a person who looks great and other people who are pointing out the flaws before maybe you've even met the person. Right. And then your own voice gets quieter and quieter and quieter as everybody else's voices get louder and louder and louder. And the most important voice is your own, like just having, right, being able to hear your yourself. Right, because there's also the voice of your friends, and then there's the voice of the dominant culture. And I, I think oftentimes on college campuses, there's this sort of value placed on the hookup culture, being casual or not being serious or not wanting to commit. And oftentimes that comes into conflict with what people actually want, which is they do want to find a partner or they do want to find a boyfriend or girlfriend. And I'm, I'm wondering how you navigate that with your students. Well, I, that is... Um you know, we were talking before about sort of family of origin or family culture. And that's one thing that I see very often is that um, I think it's easy for parents to underestimate how much their voice really weighs in their um, young adults' heads. And I think it's important for young adults to get clear on how much their views about, especially like the timing of love, like when is the best time to fall in love and when is it too early and when is it too late? Those Those norms, those notions are very often informed by parents. And um, certainly the population of young adults that I know are very ambitious, bright, successful. The world is their oyster. They've got big dreams, big ambitions. And so I think part of what perpetuates hookup culture is that idea that love feels like an inconvenience. How am I going to do, um, to study abroad, do Teach for America, intern overseas, you know, get four advanced degrees <laughs> if I have fallen in love with somebody and I have to start kind of modulating my my goals and my dreams against somebody else's goals and dreams. And I think that that concern is really, really legitimate. But I feel like my students are more at risk of erring on the side of putting love so in the backseat um, and feeling so ashamed 
um, of their desire for love, that that becomes sort of its own problem because the data is clear that the quality of our intimate relationships um, has is a really big part of our overall life satisfaction. Like career is important for sure. Income is important for sure. But love is really, really important to our experience of, um, of well-being and of happiness. So I encourage my students to not be um, afraid of that and to not be afraid of putting love and romantic relationships kind of into the equation of an overall life plan because I see students who are kind of way out in the extreme of thinking that they, it's foolish to fall in love before, you know, whatever, age 30 or something like that. And I think that continues into 20s and even 30s when young yes. adults are looking at jobs and looking at changes of location and deciding whether they're going to put love or career first. Well, and, le- and letting go of the idea that there's a right way to do it that um, prevents all kinds of problems. You know, before this podcast, my husband and I were out on this walk, you know, talking again about just sort of how we're blending um, the demands of our family, the demands of our careers, the desires we have to nurture our marriage. You know, it's just a, it's just an ongoing conversation. And um, I know that I, I know that I feel the least anxious, most hopeful when I trust that there's not a right or wrong. There's just um, the two of us finding our pathways back to connection and communication around something that's sort of like impossible to do perfectly. So when I think about somebody, whether they're you know, 20 or 40 or 60, that's really what um, to me is most important is, is having a partner where there can be those conversations we can stand shoulder to shoulder and have the conversation together about it because there isn't, there's not a right or a wrong. And oftentimes you can do both. And I think sometimes people forget that there's that option. Absolutely. Absolutely. And whatever we agree to at point A, we're going to have to renegotiate at point B and renegotiate. So just that idea of like flexibility, you know, yes. And, and collaboration. Mm-hmm. I'm curious um, if we just go back to your course um, and the way that that you approach um, helping helping your students, but also your patients navigate love and relationships. If if there's anything you've added to your course or taken out over the years, I think it's such an interesting um, it's such an interesting question and such a relevant question. Given um, you know we're this this spring when we teach the class, it'll be our 18th time teaching the class, and um, and it's in in the early days of the class, we would very often have like between three and seven engaged couples in the class. So, you know, 21, 22 years old and engaged. And they would, you know, sit in class and hold hands and take class together. And I haven't taught an engaged couple for years, which fits perfectly with the data, right? So 18 years ago, the average age of entry into marriage was, you know, 24, 25. And now it's um, 28, 29. So it is um, the age of entry into marriage has for sure gone up. And so my students feel developmentally younger uh, in 2017 than they did in, you know, 2002, certainly. And uh, I think that's for a number, you know, that's that's for, so there's a whole bunch of economic reasons that's happening. Just a lot of factors have, um, have created that change. But what it means is that I, the, the course has become much more about dating, breaking up, communication, sort of fundamental kinds of things. Um, I've, I've tried really hard to meet students where they are developmentally um, because I think if, we, if we're just talking about, the, the class is like relatively less about marriage and much more about just love and relationship, but it needs to be these kinds of like early foundational kinds of things because they're probably years, you know, many of them are years off from getting married. So I've put in more things about dating, hookup culture, and also I've added lots of material about love and the digital age, so talking about impact of pornography, texting, all that kind of stuff. It was just different, right? Different than 17 years ago. I think I've, I think I've taken out things about like compatibility and finding the right person. Like all that stuff is kind of, is so much less interesting to me than really taking care of yourself. And, and because from that place of self-awareness and self-compassion becomes just a deep sense of trust, trust that you can manage your boundaries, trust that you can um, handle handle yourself in situations. We're curious if you have 
One final piece of advice uh, for our listeners about building relational self-awareness, what would it be? I would say that it would be um, figuring out what it looks like to really become a student of love. Like, I think that, um, like, figuring out what what is it about, what helps you feel lit up and curious to better understand love? Because it's a lot... Um, you know, my week is spent as much with um, 20-somethings as it is with 40 and 50 and 60-somethings, you know, whether it's um, teaching and training them in various formats or in my therapy office. And um, and people, we, people do better when they are humble enough to say, I need to understand what it takes to make a healthy relationship. So just whatever whatever helps you find a path to being curious and studying love, I think that that in and of itself makes us more self-aware. So that whether that's finding podcasts, books, having conversations, I just did this, I did a deep dive weekend with some women a couple weekends ago and we had just hours of conversation telling each other our love stories and talking about um, relationships. And they these are women who've known each other for years, but with my sort of facilitation, they took their walls down, opened up more about the challenges of their own marriages, heard about the challenges of others' marriages. So the more willing we are to talk about this stuff together, the better we get at it. So um, that would be my thing is just figure out what helps you be lit up from the inside about understanding and valuing love. And what about for you? What's next on your horizon? Oh my gosh. I'm really enjoying um, talking about the work of the book in all different formats. The, the, the newest thing coming up is um, starting in December, we're going to do a Loving Bravely free book club where each month we're going to use um, Facebook Live and make a Facebook group. And um, each month we'll, we'll cover a lesson of the book. So we'll just go month by month, move through the book and just tackle each of these topics one by one in a supportive and completely free community. And I'm really excited about it. I have not done something like this before. So that's pretty exciting next step. Amazing. Thank you so much. This has been a lovely interview. Thanks, you guys. I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, thank you. And we hope to see you at the conference this year. Definitely. Hope you enjoyed the podcast and thanks for listening. We also want to thank Point and Passing for their original music for our podcast and website design. Be sure to subscribe to Love Link on iTunes and leave us a review. See you next time. Mm-hmm.